In this problem, we have a block. I'm calling it M2. And there's a bag of gravel sitting on top of it. I'm calling that M1. And there's a rope attached to it. It goes over a pulley. And it's attached to a, a, a container, a bucket of uh, concrete. I'm calling that M3. So the first part of the question asks, does this thing, uh, what's the maximum, or what's the friction force acting on M2? And so what we have to know is if this thing is staying put or whether it's sliding to the right. So that's the first question we need to answer. Let's take a look at M1 and M2. Let's just assume it's acting as if it was one big block. And so I'm going to draw a free body diagram for that. We have a normal force. Normal force acting on M1 and M2. We have the combined weight down. We have the tension in the rope. And there's some friction force. If this thing is stationary, it's a static friction force. And if it's sliding to the right, it's a kinetic friction force. So first thing we're going to do is, is assume it's stationary. And we'll calculate the maximum static friction force and see if that is more or less than the maximum tension. So I'm going to assume we have static friction. So uh, if the maximum static friction force is greater than the maximum tension, then, uh, then it, uh, it's uh, at rest. <clears throat> if it's less than the maximum tension, this is going to be sliding to the right, and we have to look at kinetic friction. So we know how to find the maximum static friction force. That's the coefficient of static friction times the normal force. And in this case, the normal force is mg, but m is the sum of the two blocks. The tension, the maximum tension occurs when there's no acceleration. <clears throat> when there's no acceleration, let's look at a free body diagram just for M3 for a second. We have tension up we have the weight of 3 down. And so if M3 is accelerating in the downward direction, then the tension has to be less than the weight. But if there's no acceleration, the tension is equal to the weight. So that's the maximum static friction force when the tension is equal to the weight of 3. So if you punch in the numbers, you'll find that the maximum static friction force is greater than the maximum tension. So this is at rest. Now the question is, what is the friction force acting on block two? We know the maximum friction force, but that's not what's acting on block two. Friction only acts up to what it needs to. So as the tension increases, the friction force increases, and it can increase up to this maximum value. But it hasn't quite reached it yet. So we know that this block is stationary. So that means the sum of the forces in the x direction have to equal zero. So that means that the friction force is equal to the tension. The friction force will equal M3G. And I plug in the numbers for M3 and G. I get 637 newtons. That's the static friction force acting on block 2 from the ground.
The next question is, what's the, the friction force acting on M1? Well, let's take a look at M1. M1 is just sitting on top of M2, and nothing is moving. So if we draw a free body diagram for M1, we have a normal force, we have the weight of 1, and that's it. There are no horizontal forces. So the friction on M1 is 0. If this thing was moving with constant velocity, the friction force on M1 would still be 0. There'd be no hor horizontal forces. Some horizontal force would be needed to get it moving. But once it's moving, it stays moving at constant speed because of its own inertia. It does not need a force to keep it moving at constant speed. And so there would still be no um, horizontal friction force. If it's accelerating to the right, then we would have a static friction force acting on M1. Okay, let's take a look at the second part of the problem. The block M1, or I guess it's a bag of gravel, is removed. M1 is lifted off, and that makes, uh, makes this block lighter, and M3 pulls it, starts falling, and the whole system accelerates. And we want to know what is the speed of the blocks after M3 has dropped by 2 meters. So I'm just going to draw it real quickly. M2. M3. This is the situation now. And this is basically an energy conservation problem, although you could do it using Newton's laws also. Actually, they suggest you do that. Do it using energy, and then go back, find the acceleration using Newton's laws and your kinematics equations to figure out the final velocity. Okay, so I've got my initial energy plus the work done by non-conservative forces. That's a negative number. Plus work done by external forces is my final energy. And I'm going to define my system as being uh, the blocks, the earth, and uh, and the, the surfaces here. So everything will be in my system. So I have no external forces reaching in. I do have not work done by non-conservative forces. I have friction. And I'm just going to write out what I've got here. I've got K initial plus UG initial plus U elastic initial. Those are all the energies we know about right now. I've got work done by friction, that's minus the force of friction times the distance, and this is going to equal K final plus UG final plus U elastic final. I just like to write everything out and then think about what I've got and, and put in my, some numbers there. So the first thing I want to think about is at the beginning, nothing is moving, so I've got no kinetic energy. I've got no springs in my system at the beginning or the end, so those are uh, those drop out. And I want to define, I can define my gravitational potential energy to be zero somewhere. Why don't I define it to be zero at its lowest point, which is at the end of the problem. So I'm going to say I end up with no gravitational potential energy. I start with gravitational potential energy, though. So my initial gravitational potential energy is uh, mgh. And the only thing that's changing in height is M3. M2 stays at the same height the whole time. It always has the same gravitational potential energy. The only thing that's changing in gravitational energy is M3. So this is M3 g. And the distance it falls is I'm calling little d. That's equal to 2 meters that was given in the problem.
my friction force is mu times the normal force which is mg times the distance is the work done by friction and this has to equal the kinetic energy at the end and you have to think about this for a second what's moving at the end both blocks are moving so the kinetic energy at the end of my problem is one half m2 v squared plus one half m3 v squared and I'm using the different masses here because those are different m2 and m3 but I'm using the same velocity because the velocity of m2 is equal to the velocity of m3 they're hooked up through a, uh, a cable and a pulley and they both have to have the same velocity the way they're connected so I'll go ahead and plug in my numbers here m3 was uh, 65 g is 9.8 d was 2 meters mu was given as 0 0.4 that's the kinetic friction m2 was 80 kilograms g is 9.8 d was 2 meters and that all has to equal one half times the mass which is 80 plus 65 times v squared and I get v is 2.99 meters per second. Okay, so just to review, in the first part of the problem, we had to figure out whether this thing was moving or not. So we just figured out what's the maximum static friction force, and the maximum static friction force was uh, more than the tension could possibly be, so therefore we knew it was not moving, the tension wasn't big enough to get this thing moving. And then we could figure out what the maximum static friction, what the friction force was. It wasn't quite maximum, but it was equal to the tension. So we could figure that out. And then we said that when that block is lifted off, and this thing begins to slide, then we can use energy and solve the problem that way. You could also uh, use Newton's laws to find the acceleration, and then kinematics equations to find the uh, final speed.